Welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I'm the communication specialist for UA Museums. And with me today is Lindsay Gordon, the Education Outreach Coordinator at Mountville Archaeological Park. And Lindsay, I see we have a guest today. Would you like to introduce him? Good morning, everybody. Happy Moundville Monday. Today we're going to be um, talking about 3D modeling with our friend Jeremiah Steger at the Office of Archaeological Research. He is a 3D modeling specialist and he's been mm. doing it for about five years. Yeah, thank you for joining us, Jeremiah. It'll be cool to to hear more about uh, your work and what, what you do, especially with Moundville and uh, for this Moundville Monday. And just to remind everybody before we get started, this is live. So while we are broadcasting, if you have any questions for Lindsay or Jeremiah, feel free to drop them in the comment section and we will get to them. And uh, just also as a reminder, since this is live, anything can happen. So just hang in there with us in case we have any connectivity issues, which hopefully won't be the case. Uh, but Sometimes with the internet, you never know. All right, well, I guess uh, now that we've gotten that business out of the way, uh, how should we get started today? Well, good morning, everybody. My name, uh, well, I, I've already had an introduction, so I guess <laughs> I don't have to introduce myself. <laughs> uh, I'm glad y'all could uh, join today. And uh, for those that uh, view this in the future, thank you for taking the time to be interested in, in uh, 3D modeling and archeology. span uh, most of what I do is uh, very much focused on on the public. Uh, when I was a uh, student still at uh, Wright State University in uh, Dayton, Ohio, uh, we do a field school every year. And uh, it was at a site called Fort Ancient and in Southwest Ohio. It's a very large Hopewell hilltop enclosure. It's a... Uh, about uh, a kilometer from the south end to the north end. So it's a huge site. And uh, our excavation was right next to the museum. So we had uh, lots of people uh, coming by and asking what we did. And sometimes it's kind of hard to help people visualize a dirt stain. So uh, I started getting, my gears started turning. How do I convey what I'm seeing as an archaeologist student in my mind's eye, because I'm late reading lots of papers, I'm seeing lots of pictures, maps, that kind of thing, but helping people see what I see in my head in reality. Mm -hmm. So it's, it'll be easier to communicate because I've got a lot of background and I'm trying to communicate something to, you know, some people are super interested in history and some people checked out of that class in high school in their heads, <laughs> <laughs> which I totally understand. There's some uh, some pretty dry history teachers out there, but then there's some very exciting ones. I had some great ones. Um, so uh, I can go ahead and start the- Your PowerPoint? If you want. Yeah. Yeah, and like you're saying, like 3D uh, imagery is really, really important to public interpretation because it does help visualize everything that's what something people might not be well you can't see now <laughs> um, mm -hmm. um it helps people visualize all of the things from the past so it is really extremely important and really cool <laughs> <That's right. laughs> the cooler yeah. factor helps me to keep, uh, keep coming to work in the morning too yeah, yeah. jeremiah if you want to pull your powerpoint up uh i'll I'll, uh, I'll see it on my end we'll get that started and if you want to do it full screen yeah that'd be good all right All right. Am I good? Yep, you're good. All right. So this is 3D modeling and archaeology. So obviously we are living in a digital world. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here watching me right now. Um, things that are in archaeology that revolve around the digital is uh, digital photography. We used to use film a lot. But now we uh, pretty much exclusively use digital photos, except for occasional architectural um, documentation. Uh, total stations, uh, we use those to uh, take points in the real world and transport them into the uh, world of computers. Uh, GIS mapping software, um, if you bring up Google Maps, 
So that's basically what we're talking about. Uh, and I use a little bit of all of these things in my work. Um, GPS is, our global positioning system is very important to what we do to keep track of everything that we find on the landscape. So I'm gonna be talking about two different things this morning. Um, 3D documentation is making 3D models of what continues to exist, whether it's a house foundation or an artifact, things that are uh, what is left on the landscape or in uh, artifact form. And then there's 3D modeling, which I've applied. The mass, vast majority of that is landscape and buildings, but I've also used it to uh, repair artifacts digitally. So with 3D documentation, we're producing uh, 3D models of digital versions of existing objects and structures. We can do that using, using laser scanning, uh, photogrammetry, which is what I'll primarily be talking about today, and structured light scanning. And then there's 3D modeling. And we use, I use a wide range of, of sources so that it's not just a figment of my imagination or somebody else's imagination. It's not a video game. Um, I might be working toward that level of detail um, and interactivity, but it is not a video game. Uh, so it is uh, trying to make a virtual version of what once existed on the landscape. And I use um, primarily SketchUp for the geometry that I do. Uh, SketchUp, there's a free version and a professional version. And it's uh, the free version is kind of fun to tinker with. And then Lumion 3D is what I use to render everything. Rendering is uh, adding the physics of light onto the, the underlying geometric models so uh, that it looks real, where there's shadows, there's uh, light being emitted, being absorbed. There's a lot of physics involved to make it look real, to try to fool your eyes. And it, it just makes sense. You know, we're uh, more and more in the virtual world and being able to communicate people that uh, go on Google Earth a lot, um, go on YouTube, uh, play video games. It communicates what we do in a, a friendly format so that people can under, understand and appreciate what we do and uh, that it's not a mystery. Um, and by recreating the archaeological record, we can be flexible. Um, we can combine a lot of different uh, source materials, this excavations, photographs, um, measurements, uh, artifact placement, and kind of combine them all together so that we can look at it in one, at one look at it in one place. So let's talk about the modeling of things that it still exists. Um, photogrammetry in one form or another has been around a while. Uh, not in its modern form, obviously. Um, the thing that I can compare it to in my mind, uh, when I was younger, my grandmother would watch me and she had a device that was wood and it had a, had a viewport and a handle, and you put these cards uh, in the back, and they were slightly different images. And when you looked up to the, the viewer, mm -hmm. it would make them look 3D. Um, but in what we do now, it's become a science. It's making measurements from overlapping photos, um, and that 
in turn makes a a cloud of points. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more about that. Um, and sometimes we're looking to make a complete model of a complete object, like a, a, a pot, mm -hmm. or a vessel. And sometimes we're looking to make a partial, uh, for instance, a petroglyph on a cliff. It doesn't make sense for me to try to capture the entire cliff. I just want yeah. the petroglyph. So in the planning stages, because this is you know, involves planning, there's a lot of a lot of things that go into this. Um, how large is the object? Am I going after a cliff or am I going after <laughs> a tooth? Um, how complex is the geometry? Is it a simple bowl or is it a bottle of some kind? Uh, if we're outside, photogrammetry is kind of uh, finicky. Um, it works best in an overcast environment because every time uh, shadows move over time and that messes with the software. Um, and there can't be any people walking through while I'm trying to uh, do a photogrammetric model. I can't be, have uh, excavation being current while I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And here's an example. Uh, this is a chimney base. And you can see these little blue boxes are all the places that I took pictures. So I've got pictures taken at a distance, uh, pictures taken more close up, and from both the outside and inside. And at different um, distances. And so at first, you get a sparse point cloud. You kind of see that it is what we took pictures of. Mm -hmm. um, it starts to resemble it. And then we've got a geometric mesh, which itself becomes very helpful at times. Um, for instance, if we're doing a, uh, a cliff where there's a lot of petroglyphs, uh, we can strip away the texture because sometimes, uh, like at the Medicine Lodge site in Wyoming, there's a lot of different colored rock going on where the, the chiseling took place. And being able to take the texture away, so all that's left is the geometry, you can pick up uh, glyphs that you can't really see very well with the naked eye because all you've got is the underlying geometry. So the geometric mesh comes in handy on, in its own right. And then here's a textured model, and it looks a lot more like the real thing. Mm -hmm. And you can zoom in pretty good too, oh, that's good. which is something you can't do once you're back in the lab, is this might be a feature that has to completely move because there might mm -hmm. be a, a different, perhaps uh, Native American feature underneath of it. And so once this is moved, it's gone. Um, anything you wish you could have done uh, is gone, but uh, with the GM, uh, photogrammetry model, it's like being able to go to a snapshot in time and be able to zoom in and perhaps uh, look at things that you didn't see when you were out there. And here's another example. So a chimney base is not that big. A uh, dam, however, is fairly <laughs> large, <laughs> but it can still have benefits. Uh, this is the Lake Purdy Dam in Birmingham, Alabama, and it was built in the early 20th century. And our job was to document it before they did some uh, repairs because the they have uh, some water gates on the base that allows the water to come out underneath rather than exclusively flowing over the top. And those, old, those pipes were quite old and were starting to get clogged and they had to replace them. But 
when you start dealing with old things like that, sometimes accidents happen. And so it's best to just document it ahead of time before you make a mistake. <laughs> um, so we produced this model and uh, kind of as a proof of concept that it could be used for something this large. And we were able to, uh, you can actually zoom in and, and look at the, the stone courses and just be able to, to see it, how it would look prior to their repairs. So like I said before, sometimes the repairs can alter the integrity of the, of the structure. Um, and it's more optically true than a two-dimensional drawing. We don't experience a dam in two dimensions mm -hmm. um, or black and white or as a line drawing. We see it in uh, color in 3D. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, a more uh, interesting experience, but it's also more accurate experience. And you can see uh, on the lower right hand is the uh, two-dimensional picture. And on the upper left is the, the 3D model. Oh, Jeremiah, we have a question. Oh, um, question. And um, the question is, um, does the process change when you're trying to capture things from dif of different sizes? And are there um, any challenges? Yes. <laughs> yes to both of those. Um, <clears throat> that's why uh, you have to take geometry into uh, consideration. Whether it's a small object or a large object, um, you're going to have to take pictures of all the angles that exist um, from the different perspectives. So like each one of these uh, walls mm -hmm. along the, the dam, you have to take pictures on each side. Uh, in the planning process, you got to make sure that you can get to those places because um, sometimes you might not be able to um, for safety's sake. And uh, there's a time component because mm -hmm. we work on projects and things got to get t done on uh, a certain schedule. So uh, this might not be the best option for something uh, small like a single house uh, documentation, but for uh, a large dam that has uh, cult real cultural significance to the uh, region, it's worth considering. Does that, does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about digitizing of, of artifacts. Um, there's a lot of different options like laser scanning and structured light scanning. Photogrammetry just uses a camera and software. Uh, no lasers required. And so it's less expensive and it's more versatile because you're out in the environment. Mm -hmm. The laser scanner, um, you're stuck inside the lab. <clears throat> Although a lot of the times with photogrammetry, I'm using it in the lab. I could also use it in the field to make a 3D model of an artifact in situ while it's being excavated. Because sometimes fragile artifacts break in the process of excavation. And so it's uh but i can't drag a laser scanner out <laughs> mm -hmm. to the to the excavation unit so um it's more versatile um and a, a big deal of it is being able to share it with other researchers um for instance uh there's uh, some pretty substantial uh native american museums in in england which and they have uh, some interesting collections and 
sometimes researchers from other countries like England come over to the United States mm -hmm. to take a look at artifacts to, while they're uh, working on a project. Well, that costs money to travel. And sometimes like in our current situation, a pandemic, they can't travel. And so uh, with photogrammetry, we can make a, a 3D scaled version of an artifact they might be looking for to, to research, research and study and take measurements on and email that or email a link to that object so they can uh, either experiment with it digitally or they could print it and have it in their hands, which is a, uh, it's a whole new world. Yeah. <laughs> and it can be highly detailed uh, down to uh, uh, nanometers, which is important for studying things like incising in, in um, pottery. Now we're going to be talking about uh, 3D modeling of past landscapes, which is what I do the most. Mm -hmm. So first of all, it's about people. It's technology, and that's really cool. But uh, people matter in, in archaeology. And uh, what I do most of the time is historic archaeology, which... Um, allows me to talk to people that are still alive, that live in a town or lived in a village that's no longer there. Uh, and sometimes they're in their 80s, 90s. Uh, I would you like to try to remember something from 50 years ago? Right. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it's a struggle to remember what happened yesterday. Uh, but with the 3D modeling, it's kind of like being a forensic uh, artist, reconstructing a, a face of a, of a criminal. Um, although this uh, is usually not criminal. Um, <laughs> being able to take their memories in stages and start and the pictures and other things and reconstructing. Uh, a past landscape and then showing it to people that used to live there uh, or lived there during a certain time period that I'm going after and get their feedback. And they're often able to remember a lot more because they've got a lot more cues mm -hmm. to rely on. Um, whether it's, wow, that looks exactly like what it was or no, that's not quite right. Yeah. And, uh, it really helps me to get it accurate as well. And it's uh, a good test for engaged for how I'm doing accuracy wise and whether my process really works so that when I apply it to something like a native American village where it's been gone for hundreds of years or maybe even a thousand years, I have some confidence from working on historic projects that the process um, has a good chance of being as accurate as, as it can be. Mm -hmm. um, part of science is making guesses, but educated ones. Uh, and we can use with 3D the landscape like a lab. Does this, does what we have drawn in like 2D maps make sense when it's in 3D. Does what we see in the field line up what, with what we see on like the Sanborn fire insurance maps? Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's discrepancy. Um, we're visualizing a lot of data when it's a 3D model. Sometimes it's easy to look at a 3D model and miss it. How much is going into uh, making that visualization? And then structuring the mind's eye. Uh, when I first 
started getting into it. And like I said, I wanted to others to see what we as archaeologists see in our mind. The more I've done this, the more I realize that sometimes what we see in our mind's eye, even educated, is ends up being wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it uh, it helps me to clarify mm -hmm. uh, what the past looked like. It's like fact checking yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. So here's uh, the first example is Mitchell Dam Village in Chilton County. Uh, Mitchell Dam was the second major hydroelectric dam built by Alabama Power. Um, it was built in the early 1920s, and it was a amazing what they were able to accomplish back then. Um, it's visualizing many types of data. Uh, it's building on the success of, uh, of the Lay Dam, which was the first uh, hydroelectric dam that I modeled. And the first time I started using uh, rendering software to make it more lifelike. And when, going, when building a 3D model, I'm basing it on facts. So it's, we've got historic aerial photographs, we've got architectural drawings. Right away, you can see from the architectural drawings that what you see on a drawing, it's hard to uh, convert that in your mind mm -hmm. to something real. For an architect, it might not be that hard. But for somebody who's not used to looking at architectural drawings, it's like, what does that look like in reality? And from historic photos, it's all in black and white. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they can be a little bit blurry. Uh, and especially like walking, watching a Civil War documentary, uh, sometimes there's just so much black and white being thrown at you, you almost get this misconception that people back then experienced it in black and white, and they mm -hmm. did not. They experienced the Civil War uh, in full HD color, mm -hmm. like we experience our present. And <clears throat> I also use very modern techniques such as LIDAR imagery where they shoot uh, lasers at the ground surface uh, and are able to strip away the vegetation. So I get what the, the ground surface looks like in the site as it is right now when the LIDAR imagery is taken. And you can see in the LIDAR imagery, I hope, uh, where the ground has been disturbed in the southern portion, where it's very unusually flat when everything around it is uh, very sloped. Yeah. And uh, this Mitchell Dam was rebuilt uh, in the uh, 1980s. They built a whole new powerhouse and uh, leveled sections of where the village once was before it had been documented. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, we sometimes we get in really cool situations, very close up black and white images that can be very helpful. And sometimes there's still things left. Uh, on the left-hand side is a field photograph of uh, the schoolhouse where the kids from the village attended school in the 20s through the 40s. And uh, doing these projects, a lot of times I get to interview people that live there, and a lot of times they have really neat photographs. They weren't taking photographs of their house. They were taking photographs of their family. Right. But I get to benefit that. They were standing in front of the house. So <laughs> I get uh, more glimpses into the past. Here's a, I'll just give you a, a short example of the, uh oh, that didn't work. There we go. So this is uh, Mitchell Dam as it was, I reconstructed it in. Uh, why is this not playing? 
Oh, it's loading. But I think it did not load earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, PowerPoint is not responding. <laughs> I guess this is one of those things that you said it can be unpredictable. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's it's live. Anything can happen. Yeah, just a restart PowerPoint. Uh, PowerPoint that that should be fine. So, so for something like the Mitchell Dam, do you have to incorporate um, drones or anything like that? How do you cover such a large area? Uh, I, I know you you might typically, and correct me if I'm wrong, but just kind of walk around locations. But how would you do that with a dam uh, that's so big? Well, we have talked about using drones. Uh, drones, particularly by water sources, can be, uh, from personal experience, dangerous. You can make one mistake and the drone can uh, have a watery grave. That's true. <laughs> so, as much as possible, I try to use aerial uh, photography, uh, satellite imagery, um, and also historic uh, aerial photography so that I can overlap those those resources and the, the LIDAR itself as well. The, the LIDAR typically becomes the base of the geometry. Since this is accurate as I can get it um, in modern times, and what I sometimes need to do is take old contour maps and reconstruct the land surface before I ever start adding uh, 3D models onto the surface. Hoping that this works this time. Oh, it's moving now. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to full screen and then it stopped. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. So, this is what the client sees. This is um, a part of the final product. Mm -hmm. I'll show a little bit of. Um, prototype later but so i bring in multiple different things like i've got uh textual history old maps and old, uh, photographs as you can see this was a massive construction project yeah in the 1920s Can you guys hear the, the birds chirping or no? Uh, no, I don't think we can. Okay. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Just That's know, a, everyone, there are birds chirping in the background, and you can probably hear the water. <laughs> yeah, you can hear the water coming over the dam and the breeze through the trees. <laughs> Trying to go for that realistic experience. But you can see this is a, a whole built environment that people experienced going to work. So this is people that were necessary right by the dam to make sure everything was being built correctly because they had mm -hmm. two years to get this whole thing done. They worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week in shifts, oh, wow. of course. You can see uh, that the buildings on the side are gray. Initially, I had made them to be brown, uh, like plywood, that kind of thing. These these buildings weren't built to last. They were mm -hmm. built to be around for uh, a couple of years. But when I was researching the records, I found that everything was covered in tar paper mm. to keep in the uh, – to provide extra warmth in the winter time, in the fall and the spring. And this was a segregated village. This was the 1920s. There were the uh, African-Americans were living in one camp and the whites were living in another. And so there was a lot of overlap, a lot of similar facilities. 
you can see in the on the right there that uh, a couple of buildings caught on fire one night and uh, the more I consider it the more I realized that they must have had a a system because there were there were places to get water throughout the village mm -hmm. um, but they must have caught it pretty quickly and got a bucket brigade together because otherwise all four of those ha rows, well, you can see each row of houses there in sets of four, only two of those burned. So, so they must have gotten it out quickly. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can get a glimpse into a, a single event or thing that happens in the, the landscape. Because we also did a complete survey of this entire landscape. And we actually did excavation units um, where those houses burned and found some fragments of, of burned uh, wood and some other things. This was inherently very dangerous work. This is this was before OSHA. Mm -hmm. um, they were sometimes working over rushing water, uh, high up on uh, wood frames. So they needed a hospital on site for pro problems. And they mm -hmm. actually had a very good record at all the dams uh, for surgeries and uh, survival from surgeries and uh, burns and other things. So they, they took as good a care as those people as they could. Which is kind of unusual. Company towns, sometimes like coal, coal mining towns, could be brutal. But, so that's an example of a 3D landscape. With, you've got vegetation, you've got change in topography. Mm -hmm. And this actually, this uh, building right here, <clears throat> I actually wasn't convinced that it was here because when we uh, did the survey, I, could find, I cu couldn't find much in the way of remnants of this building. Um, so I had to, I tested to see if it would work there. And I, for that three, for the architectural drawing to fit there, I had to make all these uh, mm -hmm. cross beams and posts to keep it upright and from falling down the slope. But <clears throat> actually after we had got to that point, they found a pic, an aerial picture that showed it in the woods exactly where it is so <laughs> it was a an interesting experiment jeremiah i have a question in terms of uh the creativity that you're able to employ with some of the 3d modeling are are you the one making the the judgment call of the the really nice aerial shots that sort of sweep through the village are you making camera uh shot choices with this yeah so i usually work with the client to see what they want to highlight um in this case is alabama power and this is their own personal company history since they built the dam and they still own the land uh, and you know work with them uh to highlight the fly through whether they want to do a fly through or if they or whether they want to do a walk through Hmm. Um, so usually I combine them a little bit because there's things that you can't see when you're walking on the surface. And then there's details that you can't see if you're just doing a fly through. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I do multiple videos so that uh, you get both. Um, and I also try to work with our architectural historian to make uh, choices with the architecture. Sometimes the uh, what they built from the architectural drawing is not exactly according to plan. 
And so sometimes I see the aerial photo and it's a little bit from a distance and blurry, but I can see plainly that they made some adjustments to the architectural drawings. So I work with a historian to make edu more educated guesses. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I was just I was just curious as uh, to to how you made it look so nice and, and what your what your create like if you had the ability to be a little creative with some of this stuff. So yeah, I think so. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, the 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 videos are done in, in Lumion 3D, and so I make uh, points at which the priorities are through the video and it renders the model as it goes along. Mm -hmm. So it's, it can be time consuming, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it helps the client better understand their past in this situation and helps the, like I added a lot of the 3D images, like still images of the videos and the models into the report to make it more interesting. Because me personally, if I, I spend a lot of time on a report and a project, I don't want it to just be glanced at and then thrown in a file uh, folder and in a filing cabinet never to be seen or heard from again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I want it to be something that people are interested in and enjoy and learn from. So this is, I'm going back to the PowerPoint, and this is old Cahaba. If uh, you're from Alabama, uh, Cahaba was the first official state capital uh, once Alabama was a state. There was a, uh, St. Stephen's was a previous capital when it was a territory, but once it was a state, um, they moved it to Cahaba, and it was there for a couple of years before they realized they built it on a floodplain and that was probably not the best place to, to build the state capital. And so it was then uh, moved to Tuscaloosa, which there's the, the Tuscaloosa uh, state capital. There was a state house built in Cahaba, uh, but it partially caved in, which was one of the reasons they moved it to Tuscaloosa. <laughs> um, but uh, this is the would have been something like what was built, what they planned to build at Cahaba. And here is its location. It's just uh, you can see Selma <laughs> spelled a little bit differently in the mm -hmm. upper right hand corner S E L L M A, uh, which is not what you'll see in a modern map. And here's uh, Cahaba right at the uh, bend in the river before it hits the Alabama. River. It's in Dallas County. This was the town plan, uh, how they were wanting to build it, all these uh, blocks and uh, streets laid out like a, a modern city. And right there in the center was where the, the state house was supposed to be. And this actually was a Native American village about the time of DeSoto. And uh, they were repur repurposing it to the state capitol. And this is the, the modern satellite image and uh, the LIDAR with the streets superimposed. As you can see, it's not a modern city. <laughs> it never developed into that, um, not fully. And so in the model, I'm using the different types of base maps to try to uh, start from accuracy. And then uh, this is the remnants of the Methodist church. There's not a lot of remnants left of the city. Uh, well, I guess town of Okahaba. But thankfully, somebody put took some... Uh, some photos while a lot of the buildings were still standing.
But this is the 1890s, and uh, the town had pretty much been abandoned after the Civil War because the cotton economy uh, took a bad plunge. And it just kind of slowly uh, deteriorated. The uh, you can see where the the building has been sheared off uh, and uh, torn down. This was once the uh, Dallas Hotel, which was uh, almost brand new in uh, eighteen fifty eight, and uh, by the night the eighteen nineties. It looks like it's been a hundred years since there's been anything there. And this is the start of the reconstruction, uh, making it into to color, using the, the historic photos to recreate the buildings to scale. One of the nice things I can do in SketchUp is I can uh, use a historic photo and build a 3D model around the photo itself uh, to scale, which is very important in fitting it back onto the landscape and not, not having it have a building twice as high as it's supposed to be or half as wide as it's supposed to be. This is another, uh, this is an example of the Crocheron Mansion. This is one of the last ones that was still standing. And you can see it's it's a little rough around mm -hmm. the edges. It's been a while, little while since those uh, pillars were whitewashed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you can just see the roof start to starting to crumble on the right hand side. And you can see that is not a manicured lawn. Not that they would have had a modern lawnmower back in the the eighteen fifties, but it wouldn't have had uh, leftover. Uh, corn crops right in front of the mansion either. Right. And so this is the the reconstructed man reconstructed mansion, and you can see the the town in the background, which you can't see in the other photograph. So one of the benefits of a three D model is once you've built it, you can make still images and fly throughs from any angle that you want. You're not limited to. Uh, a one-time picture. So you can go back later and make new choices if you want to. And since it's all a 3D model, if you find uh, more re or uh, find new photos from the past, you can go back in and make adjustments and corrections. And this is the Female Academy. And this is it in in 3D. And you can see the columns here were brick instead of the uh, whitewashed uh, concrete of the the other pillars in the Crusheron Mansion. And you can see I use <laughs> a historic photo actually in the model to help the person or people viewing the walkthrough or fly through see that it's based on reality. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, a verification and a check that uh, what I'm doing is as close as I can get to the original. So one last, how am I doing on time? Got about 10 minutes and we got some questions. So. Okay, good. Well, I've got about, uh, I think, about five minutes left. <laughs> um, so one of the my current projects is Columbia, Alabama, which is on the Chattahoochee River. Um, if you uh, throw a, if you've got a really good arm and you can throw a rock from uh, Columbia over the Chattahoochee River, you'll, uh, it'll land in Georgia. <laughs> uh, so it's in the southeast corner of the state. And this is an aerial of the town in the early 1960s. And the, the historical society there um, contracted me to recreate the town as it once looked in the 1940s and 50s. 
and this is how it looks. And recently they uh, received another grant because they really like what I've done so far, I guess. And they want me to do a period that is from the 19, the late 19th century, early 20th century. And even between the 1940s and the 1910s, things uh, architecturally changed drastically. Not to mention what kind of automobiles they were driving. You can see the difference between the <clears throat> town as it looked in the during the era of the Model T Ford and uh, 57 Chevys. So um, the town looks very different. And this is as it looked in the in the 80s. You can see it's starting to deteriorate, a lot of rust on the uh, panels. Been a while since things have been painted. And this is how it looks today. A lot of buildings have been torn down. Um, and the, the historical society is made up of folks that uh, grew up in the town. And now they're, you know, in their uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s. And uh, there's a lot of nostalgia for how it used to look when the town was a, a bustling place. Mm -hmm. And they want to bring uh, people in to see what it used to look like and hopefully bring in people that want to uh, grow the town and kind of bring some of that uh, past back. And also to communicate it to the younger generations who have never seen their town uh, at its height and to be able to communicate between generations. So there's a lot of, of usefulness for this technology beyond, uh, oh, doesn't this look cool? Look what I can do with a computer. It's uh, using it as a, as a bridge between uh, peoples of different places, mm -hmm. like people from outside of Colombia to see what Colombia looked like and between different generations. Um, some of the, oh, before I get to this, I wanted to show the, some of the Columbia prototype I've been working on. You can see all the different signage. Warehouses. Putting in vehicles. Um, I started doing, trying to make scenes mm -hmm. within the model of activity. For instance, you know, they, they had a, and, but still using, uh, what I can see in historic pictures to, uh, extrapolate an activity. They had <clears throat> a, uh, bin on the right hand side of the station. Uh, where they could fit a tire into water, you know, had a water spigot going to it, so that they could push on a tire and see where the, the leak was mm. for a tire. So obviously they were changing tires here. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, so not, you know, not having to recreate a scene that never would have happened. And uh, trying to use, you know, Period cars, uh, period jack stand, or, well, in this case, just jack. Um, just to have the most realism that I can. And like with uh, the paint for the vehicles, uh, that takes a little, some finesse. <laughs> uh, because you just you want the light to just bounce off enough so that it looks like car paint mm -hmm. as opposed to the brick in the background. Right. Or uh, with the standard oil station, you can see the neon uh, lighting of the sign. In that situation, um, you can really see it if I change this into a night scene or an mm -hmm. evening scene where the... Uh, the sign is actually emitting light and causing 
additional shadows. But all that takes a lot of computing power, which is one of the reasons that I use flyovers and fly-throughs and walk-throughs so that it's all in a uh, typical video format that it can play almost on any computer. Uh, so that they're not, you don't have to have a high-end gaming computer to enjoy the 3D model. You can see some things aren't quite done. <laughs> <laughs> So they had lots of different supermarkets and different vehicles. The buildings each looked slightly different because they went up at different times. Sometimes they replaced portions of the building. Um, this uh, WF Oakley building on the right-hand side at one time was a two-story building, but the upper story burned they were able to put it out before it was a total loss. So just some additional sources that I use. Uh, construction records. Uh, a lot of times uh, that can be helpful. Uh, like with the Alabama Power uh, models, they had uh, company records of the construction of the dam and the village. So sometimes the when they didn't stay according to the architectural drawing, they mentioned it and what they did. Other times they did not. Um, I had mentioned before the informant interviews, being able to talk to people that once lived there, uh, local histories. So sometimes I can use a uh, something written by a historian. Uh, and newspaper articles. Sometimes, like in, in Old Cahaba, the Dallas Hotel, um, since that version, I was able to work with another historian to, or architectural historian to uh, reconstruct the Dallas Hotel that had been uh, removed by the 1890s because uh, the, news, the local newspaper, when the Dallas Hotel went up, they wanted to garner as much business as they could via new t newspaper advertisements. So they gave all kinds of details about what the rooms looked like, what the outside looked like, um, how far down it went down the street. It was really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. And just, again, some of the software that I use in case somebody wants to, to fool around with it. Um, there's Terminal SketchUp. It used to be Google SketchUp but uh, Google sold it to Tremble. Mm -hmm. Tremble makes uh, total stations and measuring devices. Uh, Lumion 3D is what I use to make things look more realistic and uh, add vegetation, that kind of thing. And then ArcGIS is what almost every archaeological firm uses for mapping. And it just helps me make sure it is where it's supposed to be on the landscape. So, any questions? Yeah. Uh, Rebecca? Yeah, uh, we actually do have uh, quite a bit of questions. Um, so uh, Brandon uh, asks, what's the most fun project you've ever worked on and why? <laughs> oh. Hi, Brandon. <laughs> Glad you could join us. Um, oh. I think each project has had its own uh, enjoyment. Uh, I'm in really enjoying Columbia because uh, I get to talk to people that are very interested in their in their history, um, which is similar to talking to the people that uh, lived in the Mitchell Dam village when they were kids. Uh, just getting to hear them reminisce about their experiences how they perceive their environment because me looking at it from being at this time period, I look at it different for them. A lot of them were coming with their parents who had lit, had worked perhaps at a coal plant or worked downtown in Birmingham at the APCO offices. Uh, 
moving down to Chilton County, which at that time was pretty much the middle of nowhere, uh, to build a dam. And they loved coming out to the country, getting to run around everywhere, up and down the hills. I mean, um, at Lay Dam, it was like there, there were so many pictures of kids. There's like wild or herds of wild children running around and uh, talking to some po folks at Jordan Dam. It's like they had a bunch of different parents and they just would go to anybody's house for dinner. And it was just very uh, much a community. A lot of them uh, referred to it as their, their personal Eden, <laughs> which was just a, kind of amazing. Just being able to uh, see the past through their eyes, not just mine and not just the computers. So, uh, and uh, Brandon followed up that question of what with uh, what's the most challenging part of your work? Um, I think the most challenging is when I have holes in the data, like at Old Cahaba, there are large sections of that town where I have nothing, I don't have any pictures, uh, very sparse uh, data, uh, very not a lot of archaeology has taken place there. Um, you know, maybe in the next uh, 50 to 100 years, there will be more. And uh, because the model's digital, they can, if they find more uh, information from the archaeology, um, perhaps more uh, buildings can be added. But I think that's the uh, thing that, that, that's the most challenging is when I can't recreate as much as I'd like to. And speaking of that, do you, do you, uh, I assume you've done some work at Moundville? Have you, have you done anything with Moundville trying to recreate some of that past? I've uh, done a little bit, um, kind of proof of concept type uh, versions where it's just the LIDAR and maybe some trees and grass. Uh, making a, a whole 3D model isn't cheap. It takes me, um, it might be, might take me a day or two to build, to make a building, but when there's dozens of buildings on a unique landscape um, with unique textures and having to do research and consult with uh, professionals, because I don't know everything. <laughs> I'm not an architectural historian by trade, um, just by experience, I guess. Um, it's a... Uh, a constantly uh, changing situation. And uh, speaking of, uh, you know, working on other projects, uh, Ronald has a, a question. Well, I guess more of a comment. Uh, he says, uh, we've worked with the old Shelby Ironworks for many years, and it would be great to see one of your modelings of the facility. Um, so I guess my question to follow up with Ronald's comment is, uh, do you, do you, you mentioned clients. So are these clients that uh, come to you with a project or, uh, and you also mentioned grants. How does that work? Does someone uh, uh, approach you for a, a project? Do, do they just send you an email if they're interested in, in having you work on mm -hmm. something for them? <clears throat> so uh, my initial projects were for, Am for Alabama Power. Um, they tend to have kind of deep pockets there, the power company. <laughs> If you don't pay them, they, uh, your power goes away. Um, <laughs> but uh, since then, um, I have not been uh, have a, I've not had a lack of business. Um, it seems to be getting around uh, with word of mouth. Uh, Columbia, like I haven't actually gone to Columbia to pitch what I do. They saw what I did for Alabama Power and. You know, they were trying to be very innovative about how to the, how to bring people to the town when there's not a lot left of what used to be there. Now, some of that could easily be, you know, reconstructed in a, in a kind of modern, historic-ish kind of way, which is, I think, what they kind of want. Um, but uh, then there's the, the process of, of, of getting finances. Uh, they... Uh, receive grants from a couple of different places. Uh, my, my most, we just got a project for 
uh, the rail, railroad yards north of Montgomery. Uh, they had uh, the Western Railway had a hub there where they had shops where they uh, built railroad cars, not just flatbeds, but passenger cars. And there were steam engines coming to or to and fro, and there was a roundhouse. And, you know, anybody who uh, grew up with Th Thomas the Train uh, thinks roundhouses are cool. Um, and I think they are. But uh, so, so far, as far as getting clients, it's just been kind of word of mouth and people being interested and, and seeing it and thinking, ooh, I wonder what it, what this would look like if we reconstructed it. Um, so I guess uh, I'm always looking for more, for new, you know, different types of projects. Although I'm, I'm getting a little, little full right now. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping that this is something that continues and not just me doing it, but training others to, to do it as well. Because there's all kinds of small towns throughout the country that need attention. And that had really neat historic things happen. And people need to understand their history. And there's there's a side of history of you know if you don't learn from it you're doomed to repeat it but also learning from successes and learning from architecture you know ways to be more sustainable with energy uh, one of the things I've been uh, toying with a little bit once I have more time I'll probably get more into it but there's software programs where if you reconstruct the building in it. Uh, using the the materials, you can actually uh, it'll tell you uh, what the temperature would be like inside that house during the the, the summer. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm paying attention to that. I'm well, not well, that that might actually be a, a good sign that we need to wrap up. We'll we'll, t we'll take that as a, a signal to wrap up. But I think I think we could talk to you uh, for a long time yeah, to ask you. I mean, I have so many questions, and and uh, we we're just running out of time. But well, um, you feel feel free to email me. Okay. Yeah. I, so if anybody does have any questions, uh, reach out to Jeremiah via email and we'll put, we'll put that in the description uh, notes so that people can check that out. Because I think what you do is really important. And I think Agreed. Ronald mentioned in our comments that I think is probably going to be too long to put up because it might, Oh no, it, it uh, was able to grab <laughs> everything. But Ronald mentions that some, some historic places are destroyed and, and it's valuable what you do to preserve that history, even if things are uh, taken down or destroyed. Um, so I really appreciate what you do to to help preserve some of that history and make some of those places that did deteriorate come back alive. Because yeah. uh, I think that's that's really cool. Well, thank and you for, I was sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, as another segue, if you would like to help Mount Jeremiah and Moundville get a 3D model made, you can also donate. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's a big model. Yeah. Big that's project. A lot yeah. of research that would have to go into that. Yeah. yeah, you can you can definitely become a supporter of UA Museums by going to give.ua.edu slash museums. That's a great way to become a supporting member of what UA Museums does, and, and that will help Moundville out and what Jeremiah does as well. Um, I guess we can also, you know, plug the YouTube channel. If you want to see more content like this, any, if you want to make sure that you never miss a live stream or any of the videos that we uh, produce, you can go to youtube.com slash UA Museums and subscribe there, and you'll never miss anything. And if you want to keep in touch with Moundville, you can subscribe to Moundville email newsletter and keep up with everything we've got going on. If you just go to moundville.museums.ua.edu, there'll be an email newsletter button at the top of the page that you can uh, use to subscribe to that, uh, that email newsletter. All right. Well, I think that's uh, going to do it for us here today. But uh, thanks to everyone who watched us live and to everybody who's going to watch it later for visiting UA Museums from your home. All right. Well, happy Moundville Monday, everybody. Bye, Thank everybody. You.